It's Tuesday, so I am here with the Tuesday tip. I am Shannon uh, Shea, Dr. Shea of Dr. Shea BA. Um, we are going to talk today about how to prepare for home visits when you're working in residential, especially if you don't have someone necessarily to mentor you, because uh, that was requested. Before I get into that, I just want to take one minute because I started a thread that um, got a lot of attention and it had a lot of good comments. Um, but I realized that this group has grown so much that nobody really like knows me personally or anything about me. Um, so I get that it could have sounded like I was ultra wealthy or something. Uh, just so you guys know, I was raised on food stamps and we had like section eight apartment. Like I have never had money. No one paid for my bachelor's or master's or HD or any CEUs. Work did used to pay for my conferences. They don't anymore. Um, I graduated in 2008 right at the Great Recession. Um, I got laid off from my first job before I was board certified <laughs> as a behavior analyst. We lost all of our grant funding in foster care. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I have struggled financially for the majority of my life. I have like four jobs right now. Like it's not easy for me to make ends meet either. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know a little bit about me and where I'm coming from um, and that I do I do understand that. Um, but even then, when I was super poor, I used to, one person mentioned they looked up journal articles and learned about stuff that way and then like tried to find CEUs to add on and I used to do that. That was a great way to do it. Um, but even when I was broke, I would like try to find good programs or good education opportunities and then like out of the ones that were good, however I could afford it, you know, I would try to make it work if I could. Um, so stuff that I felt like was really important. Um, so that that's kind of what I was getting at. And I see it differently as a professor for years and from the back end as a CEU provider for many years. Um, there has been a shift of people trying to just skip everything to just get the CEU certificate, get the diploma. Um, and there's just like, it seems to me like there's a lot less thought about, um, or less uh, value in the whole process of getting there, if that makes sense. Um, but it was a good thread, really cool comments, interesting feedback. Um, I was not saying to anyone that like, you should cough up a bunch more money. Um, but there is a shift that I've seen of, you know, just get the end result however you get it versus like, let me find quality things and then among those see how I can make whatever work. Uh, so I wish I had mentioned only degree programs actually and not CEUs, but I see that for my end too. Like I see people trying to skip the video and just Christmas tree the multiple choice questions until they get them all right just to get the certificate. Like I, I have access to information that many of you probably don't because most people aren't professors and you know do all of this kind of stuff um, so I've noticed a shift from where I'm at I just wanted to see like where you guys were at and it was really interesting so thank you for all the feedback and it was really respectful so like I appreciate everyone being very cool the whole time okay moving right along home visits so what I did during home visits, cause I had my supervisor go with me like maybe the first time, maybe even not. I was in a similar position to the person who requested this. Um, so what I learned is when you get to the house the very first time on the first day, I would, cause everyone's proud of their home and you wanna condition yourself as a reinforcer with the family, the same as you do with the child if that's your client, cause you also need them to be able to work with you, right? And be comfortable around you. Um, so I found that every house I walked into, I always could find something I really, really liked or thought was really interesting. Um, and I would compliment that because people are proud of their home and it's like a nice kind of easing in to just let people show you their house. They're going to be proud of it and be like, oh, that's like a really cool picture. As long as you really think it's cool, it has to be sincere. Um, but that was kind of like the first step I would take into becoming a condition reinforcer and that would work pretty well and get rid of a little bit of the awkwardness. Um, obviously you do your service agreement, informed consent, all of that stuff on your first home visit. Um, 
things I would keep in my car. This took me a while to learn. So I was in South Florida when I was brand new and I'm back in South Florida. Um, so I would keep water even though the water would be boiling because I was just out on the road all day. Sometimes I get stuck in traffic. So I would just always keep bottles of water in my trunk. Um, in Boston that worked better because they would freeze and then like cool themselves as I brought them inside, <laughs> unless you're very thirsty. Uh, but I always had water in my trunk. I always kept baby powder in my glove box because in South Florida or in the summer, wherever you are, if you're going house to house, especially in residential, a lot of people don't have air conditioning or they don't use the air conditioning. Uh, so I didn't want to be like a stinky, sweaty mess going to the next house and I couldn't go home and shower in between my visits. Um, so I tried keeping one of the mini deodorants that you get like for travel at Walgreens or whatever, but they melt in the summer <laughs> in the heat. Um, baby powder doesn't melt and it works just as well. So baby powder in the glove box so that if you're stinky, you can get unstinky before you go on. Same idea as I always keep baby wipes in the car. Um, just cause like you can get drool and like jelly and you know, that kind of stuff on you. And you can't always, like I said, take a shower between houses. Um, what else would I keep in the car? Oh, I always had a bunch of pens. I keep hand sanitizer in like the little, you know, on the door of the car, there's usually like a little pocket area, right? That you can put stuff in, in the door. I'd keep hand sanitizer, like my car has a cup holder in there, so it would just fit right in there. And I made a habit of every time I got back in my car, I would hand sanitize the moment I got in and that kept me from catching everything from running to all different houses. Um, oh, I also have multiple sclerosis. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. Um, it's usually not very relevant, but um, I've been immune compromised for like 20 years. So if you wanna know how not to get sick, I am your woman. And one of the ways is hand sanitizer in the door. Just as soon as you leave any house, wash it off. And I did habit reversal so I wouldn't touch my face, which worked really well. Um, another free tip is when I used to go to psychiatric um, hospitals all the time or to the hospital to see a patient in the psychiatric part of the hospital, um, I was getting sick a lot and a psychiatrist that I work with gave me this great tip. And it was, she said like, as soon as you get home, like go into your garage, your house, like strip all your clothes off in the garage, put them in the washing machine immediately and go straight in the shower. And every time I've done that, when I get home from the hospital, if I get home from the plane traveling, anything like that, I have gotten sick like 10% as often since I started doing that and just taking all of my clothes off in the garage after I close the garage door so I don't get like, you know, like indecent exposure. Um, and that is really good at like not catching every single thing because when you work with kids, right? Like they're always sick with something. Um, I would also keep gloves like latex or whatever kinds of gloves in the car just in case I ever needed them because depending on who you're working with, if you're doing toileting, whatever, you may not want to have totally bare hands. Um, I would also keep a really thick sweater in my car, even in Florida, even in the summer, because when I went to see clients that either had behaviors that were like biting or um, a lot of scratching with nails, even if they have really short nails, they can like get an angle going. Um, so I'd wear like really thick sweaters and long sleeves to kind of protect my arms, even though I would be covered in sweat, but that's where the baby wipes and the talcum powder comes in. Um, I am making our field sound very unglamorous, but it's true. Um, so those are the things I would keep in my car. I would also keep a lot of pens, which I said, and I kept one of these kinds of folders, which like is just like an accordion type folder that you can get at an office anywhere. And I would have just like a bunch of blank data sheets, um, blank weekly data collection sheets, ABC data sheets, example sheets. Um, if you have to be MAP compliant, Medication Administration Protocol, so I could have like MAR, map recording forms like I could have those in there and whatever paper forms you routinely need especially on first visits I would keep like always 10 copies of every kind just in the car and then I would never forget anything so that was really handy I would recommend doing that because I think for ABC data most of you probably still use paper if that is not true please correct me I haven't done home visits well I mean I do them sometimes and I use paper but like I haven't done home visits for like a company in a while. Um, so there's that. 
The other thing that I used to, that I learned to do really quickly, and it was a rule in foster care. Um, I worked at ChildNet, and a policy of theirs is you are not allowed to accept food or drink from any house you go to, whether you're a social worker, a behavior analyst, therapist, doesn't matter. Um, so I used to explain that policy on my very first visit, and that cleared up a lot of awkwardness of like, oh, I made this food, can you try it? Um, you know, I would just say like, no, I could lose my job, and they'll be like, oh, but no one's gonna tell, and be like, you know, I just, I really can't, I'm so sorry, I just ate, you know, I mentioned this. Um, but I think it just makes things easier to explain it at the outset that you can't accept any food. Uh, like water and stuff is slightly different, um, except in some situations, um, depending on like who you're, whose home you're visiting, uh, it may not always be safe to take food and beverages from people in the house, um, which is why we were not allowed to do that in foster care. Uh, so I just kept that policy my whole career and I still do because I think it's a good idea. Um, and the last thing I would ask them when I was there is like, is it okay where I park? Should I park somewhere else? Is this a good time of day? Um, like when the schedule dies down and get all of that information. So those are the main things that are different for residential and how I kind of got by doing residential home visits. I would always, always ask to see the child's room, any area they were having a problem in. Um, but like the big tips that would have helped me the most to know at the beginning would have been the stuff I need to keep in my car, especially the baby wipes, talcum powder, gloves, sweater, water, and the blank data sheets. Just have them in the trunk 100% of the time. And that's it. So I hope that was helpful and I will see you next Tuesday.